Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out on this Friday night. I know you could have been doing many other things, but you chose to be here for some reason, and I will try to not let you fall asleep, if nothing else. Um, I uh, went to junior high and high school in uh, a small agricultural town in California that's known for growing citrus. And outside of one of the big citrus ranches, there is a crumbling old structure known locally as the Haunted Dairy. It's known as the Haunted Dairy because it is haunted by the Chivo Man, as everyone knows. This half man, half goat kind of being. Now my uh, sources, that being people I went to high school with uh, and actually lived out on, in the labor camps, uh, tell me that it's likely that the Chivo Man has probably only been around for about 50 years or so, maybe a little longer at this point. But nevertheless, the idea that that haunted dairy is haunted by a Chivo Man has managed to take root and spread to a certain extent. You might call it a local cultural belief. Uh, while I was teaching in Oxford, there was um, one of our little family trips Actually, we're going to need to get my, uh, my slides going here somehow, it occurs to me. One of our family trips was to uh, Hampton Court Palace outside of London. This was uh, one of Henry VIII's palaces. And while we were touring in the palaces, uh, we, we ran into one of the, uh, you know, the, the caretakers there, and he explained that, he, he was explaining to us uh, one of the ghosts who was known to haunt this palace. In fact, there are several, but this one is well known and well seen and all of that. There is a widespread belief that Hampton Court Palace actually has ghosts, and it's not the only old building in, in England that has uh, such residents. These two you might think of as stable enough, widespread enough that we would consider them cultural beliefs. The question that I want to address, and that's addressed by the cognitive science of religion, is where do such beliefs come from? Why do they persist? Why are they so common? And can we answer those questions by considering how it is that human minds work? So that's where I'm headed in sort of the big, broad brushstrokes. But I've got sort of three main take-home points, and I'm just going to give them to you up front so that if you do nod off at any point, nothing's no harm, you've got the main points. Or if you're just tired and want to leave, that's all right. Three points. First, humans have a common human nature. Okay? Humans do have a human nature that we all share. That's what I mean by common. And it is not, should not be placed in opposition to nurture. You often hear this nature-nurture kind of divide. Let's dissolve that boundary, and I just want to try to convince you that humans have a nature. That's the first point. Second, our nature helps explain how and what we typically learn, and therefore what becomes cultural. Okay? Second point, that nature anchors, it informs and constrains how we learn and what becomes cultural. And the third takeaway point is that beliefs and practices typically called religious by these lights are largely natural. That's what I'm going to argue or try to persuade you of. And I'm going to do that by telling you the story of this weird little area of research called cognitive science of religion. Okay? So that's where we're headed. Let me see if I can get these slides up. All right. There's our picture of Hampton Court. All right. Yeah, I get, imagine it would help if I told you what cognitive science is. My guess is most people don't know what that is. It's not something that showed up in, I don't know, high school science classes. It's not something you probably studied as an undergraduate either, unless you studied undergraduate in a very peculiar place within the last, I don't know, 10 years. Cognitive sciences are an interdisciplinary scientific area that's really only been around for generously 60 years. 
but not under that label, hasn't really come into its own until the last 20 or 30 years at best. And it's an area that then lies at the intersection of artificial intelligence, linguistics, anthropology, psychology, especially cognitive psychology and other psychological sciences, neuroscience, study of the brain, and philosophy, particularly philosophy of mind. And by at the intersection point, I mean that it's the bits of all of those disciplines that pertain to how do minds work? What is a mind? How do they learn? How do they acquire information? What are their contours? How do they develop in humans? Can they be recreated in other things? Well, what about other kinds of minds? It's the science of minds. It's the cognitive sciences. And those of us who work in this area called cognitive science of religion then try to apply insights from the cognitive sciences to beliefs, identifications, attitudes, and behaviors that you might call religious, right? Reasonably enough, okay? And as I suggested, the, a big central motivating question is why religion? Why is it that, here quoting Bob McCauley, religion like technology arises in every human culture. Religion is a universal phenomena among human groups which may well have existed from very nearly the emergence of our species in prehistory. Why is that? If uh, maybe you've heard, uh, there's you know, archeological evidence that 30, 35, 40, maybe 50,000 years ago, human ancestors were already r apparently ritually burying the dead with grave goods, very careful kinds of configurations. Why, what is that? All over the world, throughout history, across cultures, we see beliefs in ancestors, afterlives, spirits, gods. Why is that? Those are the kinds of questions we're wrestling with. Of course, this isn't a new question. Scholars have been wrestling with this for a long time. And uh, even in those in the sort of uh, social and psychological sciences, there's been attention to this question for at least 150 years. And the idea of trying to answer that question by appeal to some kind of common human nature is not a new strategy either. There are some sort of old attempts to say, well, maybe we can locate belief in these kinds of things um, in something like, uh, I don't know, uh, the need for comfort in our lives. And so you may have heard the comfort thesis for religion. Oh, people are religious because it gives them comfort. Well, if you've met many religious people, or you are one, you know it isn't always all that comforting. <laughs> and there are plenty of, I don't know, ancestors and ghosts and spooks and afterlife kinds of ideas that are far from comforting. Well, maybe it helps us get control over our lives. Well, it's a little hard to see how multiplying lots of, I don't know, uh, witches and demons and things that can get you and ruin your best laid plans gives you control over your life. It seems to do just the opposite in many cases. And even if in some cases you get comfort or you get control from these kinds of beliefs, that doesn't feel like a very satisfying explanation for why we have such beliefs. After all, in what other domain of life do we address our problems by imagining things? Wow, I'm feeling hungry. Let me fix that. Oh, that's a good burger. Right? That's just strange. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't think your way out of hunger. You wouldn't think your way out of danger. You wouldn't imagine you're safe to combat danger. So that, I don't know about you, but for me, that's just not a real satisfying kind of explanation. And, and, it's, and it, of course, it's a legi legitimate question of whether or not um, those kinds of concerns about uh, security, about feeling comfort in the world, really are human universals in the way that some theorists have suggested. So these kinds of explanations, while they did appear in uh, the 19th century, didn't get a whole lot of traction. And they were especially blown out of the water in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century, largely because of the movement in psychological sciences toward what's called behaviorism. Behaviorism 
pretty much had the stranglehold on psychology from the 1920s up to about 1960. And basically, behaviorism was the idea that the only thing that we can study about humans is their behaviors. We can't study what's going on in their minds. And what humans really are, fundamentally, are just learning machines through different kinds of reinforcements, reward, punishment, different kinds of stimuli association, just like other animals. There wasn't any place for thinking about thoughts. What we were, from that view, is sort of much blank slates that just get trained up by environmental contingencies. And so there isn't any interesting question answer, or any, any sorry, any interesting answer to the question about why religious beliefs or practices. They're just what you've been taught, or been enculturated, or indoctrinated. And that fit very well with this age at which, in human history, where there suddenly you know, the wise guys at these universities all over the United States and Western Europe were discovering the rest of the world and just stunned by the splendor of all of this cultural diversity, seemingly limitless diversity of languages, customs, practices, beliefs, values. Surely the most interesting thing about humans is they can learn anything. They can think anything. Couple with it this optimism that the Industrial Revolution produces. That, wow, we can build these fabulous machines and make these technological breakthroughs. This optimism about the human spirit seems to be, well, untethering. It's liberating. There isn't anything interesting to say about a human nature that somehow pulls back or guides the way we think. We can do what we want. So then, once we're to about the 1960s and 70s, at least in uh, most universities in the English-speaking world, the idea of explaining religion, or explaining where these beliefs come from, by virtue, by appealing to a human nature, just seemed like a silly thing to do. Why a human nature? There's no such thing as a human nature. And I said the first thing I want to do is convince you there's a human nature. Um, and that's because I think actually many of us don't believe that. We've been taught that we don't have one, that we are nothing but our social or cultural environment. That's what makes us what we are. In the 1980s, especially in 90s, new technological advances enabled new scientific breakthroughs in many of the uh, psychological sciences that enable us to start realizing that actually there's maybe more to humans than we thought. There were some precursors. There were some early precursors that suggested, well, maybe humans actually do have a, a nature. Here's a nice little example. So if you look at these photos, my guess is if you look at the one on that side, some of you would rather not look at the one on that side. Am I right? I'd rather not. Why not? I mean, some people know that that is a perfectly harmless snake, right? But still, it's a snake. And humans, it appears, have a natural predisposition to form a fear association with snakes. What do I mean by that? It's not that, you know, a baby comes out of the womb, snake, ah, you know, and nothing like that necessarily. But it is the case that if a baby sees mom react in fear to that snake, the baby is now afraid of snakes. That's it. Done. That experiment has been done with human babies and even captive monkeys who have never seen a snake before in their lives. They see a videotape of another monkey reacting in fear to a snake, and now they're afraid of snakes. You can associate scary stuff with that flower over and over and over again all day long, right? If mom freaks out every time she sees that flower, the baby's going to think something's wrong with mom, not the flower, right? Mom, relax. It's just a flower. It's kind of nice. Okay, why? Because humans have this natural predisposition to form a certain kind of association with these little wiggly things, but not those nice bloomy things, okay? And the suggestion is it's because Snakes, at least certain types of snakes, were a serious hazard for our ancestors. It was important to form a rapid fear association of these things. They're not all that great for food, arguably, 
but they're dangerous potentially. Okay, so be afraid of those, avoid them. So having a leg up on that in our terms of our learning system might have been of great value. So there's just one example of a little hint that there's something about a nature that we have. Here's another one that's a little more recent. This is by uh, Andy Meltzoff and his collaborator Moore, who they demonstrated that it appears that babies within 24 hours of birth can imitate the tongue sticking out facial expression. Not with perfect fidelity, but if you look at a baby and you stick your tongue out over and over again, the baby is more likely to stick their tongue out. Okay? Boring, right? No, very exciting. Okay, think what's involved there. The baby's just been born, fresh out of the womb. It's a nice bread-like aroma. Just kidding. <laughs> See if you're paying attention. All right, so the baby comes out. They have very poor visual acuity at that moment. They selectively attend to face-like things in their environment from birth. And then somehow they're mapping that face-like things, gestures, onto their own musculature and producing this similar kind of facial expression. They don't even know they have a face. Right? This is a whole new thing. They're not going, how did I do it? No, it's just visual to, to, to muscular mapping. That's pretty cool. Why might babies selectively attend to faces and imitation so early? Well, because humans are fundamentally social animals. We pay a lot of attention to faces. We get so much information from each other's faces, and there's a lot of information there. We need to be able to recognize and differentiate lots of individuals under different lighting conditions at different angles. Very quickly, we need to figure out when other, what other people are looking at so that we can jointly attend to those things and learn what is it that they're trying to tell me when they say, dog, and we know what that is and so forth. There's so much valuable information in human faces and a whole lot of our sociality is interacting with faces, face to face, that it appears that we naturally have systems that give us a leg up in this, okay? We have some more abstract kinds of systems that appear to develop very early in humans, apparently regardless of what culture we're in. So here's an example I like to use. Okay, some of you are really well-educated people. I'll ask you not to ruin the demonstration with your over-education, that's really kind of obnoxious and we resent at dinner parties and things. But which of these two animals are more biologically similar? What does your gut tell you? The koala and the panda, sure. Unless you're very strange, you're gonna say the koala and the panda. Okay, wise guy biologist people, What's, what do the biologists say about Which ones are more similar? The armadillo and the panda. Good. Somebody got it. I heard it. Why? Right. This guy over here is a marsupial. I don't know why that's so important, but apparently it is. Apparently these two are much more biologically related. They're much more similar. And we don't have to feel bad about that. Apparently, naturally, humans all over the place use the same kinds of tactics for sorting animals in their environments. They take into consideration things like gross morphology, the basic shape, their ecological niche, whether they're you know, living up in trees, that kind of thing, the sorts of things that they eat, and so forth. They don't care about pouches. That's not a consideration that matters to us. This is why you, you can do the same kind of thing. I, I developed this slide that I can use whoops, in lots of different countries. But you know, in North America, I could also use things like possums and raccoons. People go, oh yeah, they're pretty much the same kind of thing. They climb into dumpsters, they're dead on the side of the road, and all that. I'm like, no, no, they're not remotely related to each other. OK? But we're naturally inclined to think that they're similar. This one is kind of a little more subtle and more interesting. When babies are learning languages, you know, if I'm carrying a two-year-old and I point at this thing and I make a vocal utterance like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, wug, that's, that's just nonsense, but what the child is going to assume I mean is this thing that the rest of us would call a rabbit. 
it's not going to assume I meant fast, jumping, big ears, furry, tasty, whatever. I mean, it's, it's going to assume rabbit. It's not going to assume mammal. It's not going to assume cottontail. It's going to assume rabbit. Apparently, babies have a built-in kind of bias when it comes to learning language that focuses them on what's often called the basic kind level. Not too abstract, not too fine-grained, but just right. It's this Goldilocks zone thing. So like chair. Not furniture, not armchair, not lazy boy, but chair is where our minds naturally go. And in fact, the basic kind level in English is usually picked out by a one-word label. And that's not an accident. It seems to be just the way our minds naturally go. That's how we sort the world and make sense of it on a certain level. Okay, there are all of these little, I'm just giving you a few smattering of examples. But there's all this study, all of these studies, mostly from developmental cognitive psychology, that show that humans have all of these natural learning biases, predilections, tendencies, intuitions that bear on the stuff of the world around them, that make us make some ideas easier to think than others. They're more natural in that regard. And they seem to be largely independent of our particular cultural context. This has led folks who are doing work in this area to reject this model of the mind. Okay, Human minds are not simply blank slates, at least by the time we're grown up a certain, you know, you know once we're old people, like five years old, we're certainly not blank slates or just sponges. We sometimes talk, oh, little kids, are they're fascinating. They're just like sponges. They just soak up everything around them. And like, no, they don't. Come on, you've, you've got lots of parents in this room. There are all kinds of things you try to teach your kids, and they looked at you like you were insane. You know this. They learn some things really well. It's very impressive, some of the things they learn, like language. Try to teach them binary code, though, when they're that age, and it's going to go nowhere fast, OK? Why? Their minds aren't naturally tuned to learn binary code, but they are naturally tuned to learn what we call language. Okay, There's certain structure in human languages that is what our minds are good at. Okay, So there's structure already. There's biases, predilections, tendencies in human minds that naturally develop in ordinary human context. That's what I'm pointing to in calling human nature. Let me quickly observe, though, because a lot of people, especially if you've taken intro psychology lately and you're like, wait a minute, I heard about this nature-nurture debate thing and stuff. Ignore the nature-nurture debate. By nature, humans are social beings. By nature, humans are nurtured. Naturally, babies have mothers and fathers. But the mothers are usually right there, right? Babies naturally are born into social environments with language and so forth. That's part of the natural environment, developmental environment for a baby. Okay? So what I, the claim I'm making here is by virtue of living in ordinary human environments and having ordinary human biological endowments, there are certain kinds of predictable features, ways of thinking, that the ordinary baby is going to have or child is going to have by the time they're five years old. Okay? Let's call that human nature. That doesn't mean there isn't, aren't going to be some really interesting kinds of variabilities here and there that are culturally tuned up, that vary from place to place. But there are going to be what I'm going to call anchor points or tethers or constraints on what we're going to expect to see. Okay? Because of that fact, then, those of us who are interested in studying cultural expression have some place to look for explanations. This was a lesson that the people who ended up developing the field that's called cognitive science of religion, what they observed from what the linguists were doing. So people studying language thought, wow, OK, how do we make sense of all of this broad diversity of language out there that humans use, but yet there seem to be common features and common developmental patterns. And not every possible symbolic communication system will work, only some of them. Well, let's look at how human minds naturally process information, in this case, linguistic information. So in this domain, let's see how human minds naturally process information about the kinds of beings that are out there in the world or 
how to solve problems, or I'll give you more examples as I go along. All right? So the strategy in cognitive science of religion is to explain cultural level phenomena by looking downstairs, if you will, at human psychology and seeing how human nature maybe pushes us towards certain ways of thinking and acting. The human mind then, instead of being like a sponge, some folks are suggesting is a little bit, at least on one level, more like a Swiss Army knife. Okay? I say on one, one level. Because we're also talking a lot these days about there being at least two kinds of systems in human minds. You might think of the fast system. This is the one that's a lot like a Swiss Army knife. It seems to have different gadgets for solving different kinds of problems, like, ooh, face. It works fast. We don't have to consciously think about it. It's actually pretty hard to unlearn. It's hard to not see faces where there are faces. Okay, once you've seen the faces, oh, I see the face. Okay? Um, it's very heuristic. It's quick and dirty. And then the slow system is what we usually think of when we're sitting around listening to boring lectures and things like that. It's effortful. It's reasoned. Sometimes more accurate, sometimes less accurate. That's not one of the distinguishing features. But it looks like we have these two systems, the slow system and the fast system. And this fast system seems to have lots of specialized gadgets for solving very specialized kinds of problems which is why some people say our mind is a little bit like a Swiss Army knife. Okay? Or I sometimes think one of the results of having a mind like this is that our mind is a little bit like a shape sorter. You remember this preschool toy? Okay, they're the different shape things, you gotta find the right. You can think of the five-year-old's mind a little bit like that. That when it comes to cultural expression, by virtue of just the way minds work, there are these conceptual gaps that then get filled in by cultural input. Yes, culture needs to be there to fill those gaps. Yes, culture can decide that it's going to be, I don't know, red versus yellow going in there. But the mind's going to decide that it has to be round. Okay? You can't squeeze the square one into the round hole. The mind's going to offer a little bit of resistance if you try to do that. Okay. So those of us working in this area think that these mental tools, as they've sometimes been called, to reference the Swiss Army knife, may predispose people to believe in gods, the afterlife, to engage in ritualized behaviors, and so forth. Okay? That's the naturalist thesis. I'll give you one more metaphor. Um, and that is, imagine a bunch of ships anchored in a harbor. If you see a whole bunch of boats in a harbor, and the tide comes in, the tide goes out, and there are currents and so forth, and the boats don't really move that much, what's going on? They're anchored. Right? Something below the surface is holding them, not entirely in one spot, but roughly in a general vicinity. Our minds are a little bit like that with our cultural expression. Human minds, the, the good to think thoughts, are going to be much more likely our cultural go-tos than the hard to think thoughts. Hard to think thoughts are going to require special conditions, a really stiff wind, to move things away from that anchor, a really strong current, maybe a stretchy tether, maybe hooking that boat onto another boat. They're going to need what we sometimes, the jargon we use is, need cultural scaffolding to build up these much less natural types of beliefs or practices or whatever it is. Okay? Again, let me be clear. I'm not saying that somehow minds deterministically just sort of give us all of our cultural beliefs. That would be silly, right? We know that culture changes things. We know that there's variability amongst individuals. But it's actually much more constrained than we often appreciate. Disgust is a good example. Okay, it looks like humans have a natural system for learning disgust. And there's a good reason for having this. We are omnivorous kinds of animals, and we move around a lot. Okay, omnivorous, we eat lots of different types of things. We move around a lot, which means we move into new places and eat new different kinds of weird things. We better have mechanisms for figuring out what is bad and what is good. 
we also, once we started eating things like meats, need to have pretty quick reactions to what's spoiled. We also, because we live in big groups of people, need to figure out, well, where are the disgusting things that might be pathogenic and make us sick? It appears that we've got this gadget, a disgust system, that helps us decide something is gross and I'm, I'm going to avoid it. Okay? All right, we all, you know, it's one of the sort of basic emotion categories. It's all over the world. Every culture that's been studied has disgust. But it does get tuned up, right? I, for instance, just, I, I, maybe I'm culturally insensitive or something, but eating live octopi is problematic for me. I can't seem to do it. I find it disgusting. But had I grown up eating it, I wouldn't, OK? Now, it's not the case that just anything could be disgusting, just like it's not the case that flowers can be terrifying. It appears that our disgust system has certain boundaries on it. There are certain chemical odors that are more likely to elicit a disgust response. There are certain visual kinds of information, stuff that looks like it came from inside of an animal, actually is pretty easy to trigger a disgust response. You can't find, I don't know, a brick disgusting. It doesn't matter if your mom told you that's a disgusting brick. It's a brick. It has none of the right features to trigger a disgust response. And you can see this being tuned up in little kids, this disgust system. Um, so uh, some of you probably know, if you've spent time around little kids, uh, you know, when they're a year old or something like that, they're sticking everything in their mouths. They don't seem to know that anything's disgusting. My son picked up like rabbit droppings and would put them in his mouth. And we're like, oh, stop, oh, no, rabbit, why'd you? And then, OK, that's disgusting, right? They're getting signals to tune up that disgust system. And then when they're about three or so, you might see what almost looks like, I don't know, it's almost a, uh, obsessive compulsive kind of stuff, right? Suddenly the peas and the potatoes cannot touch each other. That, that no, the peas touch the potato. I can't, I cannot eat this way. You know, they need these hard boundaries. It's like they've overcorrected or something and everything is disgusting. No, he's disgusting and she's disgusting. And then they figure out cooties on the playground, and that's actually playing into the same kind of contamination. The, no, no, he's gross, and he's going to give me cooties and all of that. Children spontaneously cre create that stuff, and in part, it's because of these natural systems. Okay? Uh, aren't these fun, weird things? I said that there's flexibility in the system, and what I, what I want to impress upon us is that so these natural anchors are where our beliefs, our ideas, our thinking are naturally going to go. They're going to be the easy things for us to learn. They're going to be the easy things for us to talk about. They're going to be the easy things to communicate to other people. Let me give you an example. I shouldn't have shown you this slide because it's actually too provocative. Everybody's looking at it. Oh. Don't look at the slide. Don't look. Imagine, if you will, I told you that uh, on my way walking into this room, I saw a brown dog. Exciting, isn't it? That's a good story. You're like, good story. OK. You actually know all kinds of things about that dog. What were its mother and father? Dogs. Um, does it have gears inside of it? No. <laughs> Unless it's eaten up right, right. I mean, do they make it go, though? No. It's going to have sort of natural stuff inside. Um, does it move on purpose? Yeah. Will it avoid sort of big, scary things? Yeah. Will it eat things? Yeah. Um, a four-year-old knows these things, even if they've never seen a dog before. I can tell you that the... Uh, the man bee at the uh, zoo in Atlanta has just recently gave birth. And you know that it had baby manabees. Even though there's no such thing as a manabee, I made that up. Okay? And that's because it's trafficking on our normal natural intuitions about what animal, what kinds of properties animals have. Okay, yeah, there was some learning that took place, but it cements very quickly and it's pretty stable. And so then when I talk about this dog that I met, I I don't need to tell you all those details. They come for free in that act of communication. 
but it's kind of boring, isn't it? So it's, it's good, it's a pretty good kind of package to sell, but it's a little boring, it needs more pizzazz. Okay, I met, I, I came across an invisible dog. Ooh, yeah, okay, tell me more. That's interesting. Either he's crazy, or I better watch out when I go outside. Because an invisible dog can sneak up on you and do things, right? And I don't know, uh, pee on your leg and you didn't see it coming or something. I don't know. I know, too early to be scatological here. I mean, um, the point is, it looks like it's been theorized by Pascal Boyer, an anthropologist, a cognitive anthropologist, that concepts that are really close, but not quite on those natural anchor points, are especially good for cultural transmission. Because they get most of the benefits of being largely intuitive, so they're easy to talk about, they're easy to think, they're easy to invent, but there's a little twist that makes them interesting. And if that little twist also gives them what he calls inferential potential, answers puzzles like, well that would explain the barking I heard last night and there was no dog around, okay? That would explain why it is the cat was freaking out, but in the middle of the day and there was nothing nearby. That would explain why the plant fell over and nobody claimed credit for it. That would explain why I found dog poo in the middle of the rug and we don't have a dog, okay? It's got inferential potential. Those concepts are really catchy, it's been theorized. And research has suggested that's the case. I, so I put up this picture of the lion man. This is a little figurine that has been discovered in a cave in Germany. Um, and as you see, it's dated back to about 32,000 years ago. In fact, I understand that two of these have now been found. And it's suggested that it's sort of a human-animal hybrid that maybe is trafficking on the same kind of, wow, it's just slightly counterintuitive. That makes it interesting, but still easy enough to think about. That makes it a really good cultural form. And a few experiments have been done to check out, do people really remember these, what we call minimally counterintuitive ideas, especially well? And they might con contrast memory for things like a caterpillar, that is eating, which is fully intuitive, versus things like a man, that is invisible. Interestingly, What's been found across cultures now doing, using these kinds of things as an experiment, experiment stimuli, is that people remember these counterintuitive things better than the intuitive ones if they are young adults or adolescents, but not if they are seniors. Seniors remember the boring stuff better. <laughs> young people remember the weird stuff better. In like fact, young people are more likely to generate the weird stuff, too. Which suggests a really interesting thing about cultural transmission. I'm here, I'm going to speculate wildly. Maybe we get innovation from the young people. Maybe they need to be able to think about all of the weird stuff that's kind of deviant to figure out the boundaries of their community. But then once you've sort of figured it all out, you need to chill out. By a certain age, if it's new, it's just odd. It's not helpful, right? Okay? Or something like that. But anyway, this is an active area of research, but it does suggest that things that are slightly counterintuitive are actually really good, especially for young people to remember, to be able to talk about, to be able to transmit to each other. Okay? And it's been suggested that a lot of the cultural concepts we call religious fit in this space. They're minimally counterintuitive. They're not entirely bizarre, but they're just a little, just a little odd. That can't be the only uh, reason why religious beliefs are sort of come naturally to people and why they take the certain forms that they do, but it does seem to be part of the story. Here's another part of the story. Maybe some religious ideas really are just very close to those anchor spots. So this is some work from uh, Deborah Kellerman, who is a developmental psychologist at Boston University. Um, and she's studied what she has dubbed promiscuous teleology. Uh, promiscuous teleology is, um, well, she uses the word promiscuous here to mean that it's applying, so sorry, teleology 
is thinking in terms of design and purpose. That's what she means here. Something is for something. It has a purpose. It has a goal. It has design behind it. And promiscuous, it's kind of been spread around a little bit, you know, uh, indiscriminately, and parents just wouldn't approve. So, for instance, years ago she asked, why do you think the rocks were so pointy and showed kids pictures of pointy rocks like this? Why do you think the rocks were so pointy? And then gave kids options, like, uh, well, well, in one study, actually, kids generated, just freely generated responses like, well, they were pointy so that animals wouldn't sit on them and smash them, which is kind of a funny thing to say. And kids were much more likely to generate answers like that, that have purpose or reason, a direction behind it, then they were pointy because bits of stuff piled up on top of each other over a long period of time, a mechanistic kind of explanation. And in fact, then in later later study, she pitted these kinds of explanations side by side and asked kids to choose which one is a better explanation. And kids almost always prefer the they were pointy so animals wouldn't sit on them type of explanations, the teleological explanations. Even if an adult is the one saying, no, 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 so I think they were pointy because bits of stuff piled up on top of each other over a long period of time. Kids go, eh, so animals wouldn't sit on them. Right? Another example, it's not just that kids just gullibly listen to whatever parents say. It just doesn't work that way. Okay? Here's another example of one of Kellerman's studies. I'll read the text for you. I should picture of uh, two little kids and a picture of a tiger. Um, see this? This is a tiger, and here's Ben, and here's Jane. Ben says a tiger is made for something. It could be that it's made for eating and walking and being seen at the zoo, or it could be that it's made for other things, but Ben is sure that a tiger is made for something, and that's why it is here. Jane says, that's silly. A tiger isn't made for anything. Even though it can eat and walk and be seen at the zoo, that's not what it's made for. There's just things it can do or that people can do with it. Jane is sure that a tiger can do many things, but they aren't what it's made for, and they aren't why it's here. Point to who you think is right. Ben, who thinks a tiger is made for something, or Jane, who thinks that's silly because a tiger isn't made for anything. And you see where this is going. Kids will more often point to Ben. So not only do kids seem to be attracted to the idea that natural things have purpose, have direction, but that that's why they're even here. It's for that purpose. Another study, she asked kids open-ended questions like, why did the first ever bird exist? And they said things like this, to make mu nice music, because it makes the world look nice. Well, why did the first monkey exist? So then we had somebody to climb trees so there could be an animal in the jungle. Why did the first ever river exist? Well, so boats could come into the water, so that people would do fishing. Yes, the children seem to be suggesting that we're sitting here with boats looking for water. Gee, we've built these really swell boats. If only we had some water to put them in. Ah, river! Cool. Nailed it. Okay, this is what she's dubbed promiscuous teleology. It looks like kids are really naturally drawn to this idea that natural things in the world are here for a reason, and that's part of their origin story. That's where they came from. And this has replicated across cultures, even in places like China. And kind of interestingly, it does not look like um, we just outgrow this. It looks like you have to learn not to think this way through formal education. Because she's looked at uh, adults in some parts of the world where they don't have formal education, and they answer like eight-year-olds. And she has looked like at Alzheimer's patients in certain designs, and they look like eight-year-olds. Interesting. Um, that line of research has led her also to look more specifically at design and especially origins, like, and she's called it this sort of intentional design bias. Um, so we've been talking about mountains or rivers, monkeys, birds, just those questions we had there, uh, those examples I showed you. Now here's the question, did someone or something make the first ever mountain exist? Or did it just happen? And when kids are given these kinds of options, the most popular response, especially for animals, is someone. Someone made the first ever monkey happen, or the first ever bird exist. And again, this seems to replicate across cultural groups. 
children seem to think that there's design and purpose in the natural world and that someone is a really good account for that design and purpose that they just perceive. Okay? But of course they do. Even 12-month-olds seem to know that it's only intentional-minded beings, what we might call agents, seem to create order. How do we know 12-month-olds know this? I had to throw this in so you know there's some really fun experimental work going on with babies. You put babies in front of screens. One of the fun things about babies is you can kind of record where they're looking and their expressions, and they get bored with things that they're expecting. So you can, what's called habituate them to certain kinds of displays, and they'll start fussing and squirming and show me something new, and then if you show them something new, it recovers their attention. So they dishabituate. It's called habituation, dishabituation studies. Here's one by um, George Newman and Frank Kyle from Yale University, where they showed babies what I tried to recreate here is um, there's a stack of blocks. So imagine you're a baby, you see this display, there's a stack of blocks, and then there's this ball, and a screen goes down and hides the stack of blocks. It didn't smash them, it's just in front of them. And then the ball moves behind the stack of blocks, or behind the, the screen, and the blocks are all jumbled. Okay, half the babies saw that display first. The other half saw this display first. Jumbled blocks, screen goes down, ball rolls behind. <gasps> this is the one that gets babies' attention. Okay? They go, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. And I'm talking about 12 and 13 month olds. They seem to go, whoa, hey, didn't see that coming. But then they did another condition. They put a little face on the ball. And instead of it rolling in, it sort of scooted in. But otherwise, it's the same study. And now they just kind of yawn and wet themselves or whatever they do. Okay? Not at all sort of surprised by this one. Providing at least some evidence that already when they're 12 and 13 month old, they're sensitive to the idea that things with faces, agents, they can stack blocks, they can unstack blocks, they can do all kinds of stuff. They can impose order on chaos. But if it's not an agent, that's surprising. Okay? So it's not a surprise then that if children are seeing design in the natural world, they're wondering who did it. Piaget, the famous sort of grandfather of uh, developmental psychology, actually observed something similar in the 1920s. Now he called it artificial, childhood artificialism because he thought, children thought, humans built the world like Lake Geneva and the mountains. And that God was just the name of maybe the foreman of the building crew. Uh, more recent studies, uh, for instance, by Susan Gelman and Kathleen Krimer at the University of Michigan suggest, nah, children are pretty clear that by age four, if you ask them very systematically about could a human have created the moon, the, the ocean, the sun, and so forth? Do you think people made it? They say no. They just, they don't buy that at all. Four-year-olds know that people make chairs, and it takes someone else to make these other things. And studies from Oxford and other places have suggested, yeah, ch children very easily can slip God into that conceptual spot. They're more, it's like seven, British children were in this study were seven times more likely to say God made these natural kinds of things than people or that they just sort of spontaneously happened or no one knew, okay? So who designed the natural world? Well, God's at least a good candidate. God fits closely enough with that conceptual space in the children's head shapes order for a creator for the natural world. There are other kinds of factors that cognitive scientists of religion have sort of suggested contribute um, to uh, the formation and sustenance of beliefs in things like gods, ancestors, and so forth. I don't really have enough time, so I'm going to skip through some of these because um, it's getting late. But I'll summarize then for you real quickly what I see as where the evidence is pointing, and it's the subject of my book out there. It's what I call the born believer's thesis. It's that humans do have this nature. And by virtue of the kinds of animals we are, with the kinds of minds that we have, growing up in ordinary human environments, 
makes our minds really receptive to the idea that there are things like gods out there. Why? Well, we naturally think of the world as having design and purpose. We naturally think agents, beings that have minds, purposes, aims, ac account for that really well. We actually find, children find, the idea of an invisible being not at all difficult. We've got studies that show that. In fact, you know, probably, that lots of kids have invisible friends. And they have really rich and interesting interactions with these invisible friends. In fact, it's about half or more kids probably have had an invisible friend by the time they're five. And no, they're not weird kids. Actually, the kids who have had invisible friends generally are better, more socially adjusted and adept than kids who didn't. Okay. I'm just putting that in there to show that actually invisibility, not a problem. And these kids were certainly not indoctrinated that their friend was invisible. They spontaneously came up with that. Okay, So invisibility, not a problem. We have some experimental evidence I talk about in the book that kids actually find the idea of someone being super knowing is really easy. And recently, uh, some studies that I've been doing in China and Ecuador suggest that kids in the, at least those two countries we also have some data from Israel as well suggest immortality is a really easy one for kids too. In fact, it seems that kids have to learn that people are going to die, not learn that they won't, if you follow me. So the idea of someone who's not going to die, easy, because they didn't assume anyone was going to die anyway. That's something you have to learn. Okay, you're starting to get the picture. This is the, the Born Believers thesis. And it's just a variant of other sort of why religion is natural kinds of theses. It's been suggested that in addition, or once we have these sort of mental tools that help give rise to or make us really receptive to the idea of gods, ancestors, afterlife, and so forth, once you put those ideas together in cultural groups, then they actually end up being really adaptive for, at least for groups. So it's been theorized, and there's some empirical evidence to back it up, that people are naturally fearful of eyes. Or at least it curbs their behavior a bit. So if you've seen these sort of honor boxes, like, you know, there's a coffee station, and then there's, you know, put, you know, 50 cents in at the end, but nobody's monitoring this. Well, cute little studies have shown if you put, you know, draw, put a card there and draw little eyes on it, people are more likely to put money in it. Weird, huh? Or it's been done on computer screens. Put a little, couple of eyes on a computer screen and people doing a computer-based task are less likely to cheat on the task. It appears that thinking that we're being watched actually helps us refrain from antisocial behavior of certain sorts. Well, gods can do that job rather nicely. Okay, especially if they're the kinds of gods who actually have eyes, which in many cultures they do. They're, you know, if you go to a place like India, there's, there's a god on every corner. You can see them all over the place. They're watching. Okay, watching gods may have actually encouraged people to be more cooperative, less antisocial. Religious rituals have been suggested that they help signal group membership and that you can trust me because we have common values. I'll talk more about some of these things tomorrow morning. And then there is also evidence that God-centered meaning systems actually reduce stress and produce overall well-being. People who go to church a lot, they live longer. They tend to be healthier. Um, they tend to actually donate more time and money to other, and blood for that matter. Again, I'll return to some of these things tomorrow. But all of these are little pointers to the idea that maybe participating in religious practices and having religious beliefs, at least in some contexts, ancestrally were valuable. And maybe that's part of the reason they're here, too, is that they become adaptive. Um, I've just mentioned some of these things. And again, we'll get to that tomorrow. That's kind of the naturalness of religion thesis which in short is just that people are disposed to generate and accept religious ideas because of how their minds naturally work in common human environments. Um, that's my big story for today. 
I'll give you one more final passing kind of metaphor, just because I know I get lots of confusion about what I'm saying. I've already heard it in some of the discussion beforehand. It's already in the title in your brochure about, are we hardwired? Notice I never used the word hardwired. Hardwiring is a metaphor from, what, elect electrical systems. I think these things are hardwired. They suggest you can't change it easily. I don't know if they are or not. I can't see. It's blinded. Okay? I'm not saying that religious beliefs are innate or hardwired, but what I'm saying is that they seem to be a conceptual path of least resistance. They're not surprising. They're not abnormal. They're not bizarre. They're very easy. It doesn't mean that every single person is going to have them, of course. In this way, it's a little bit like dance. Okay, I think a similar story could be told for dance. Pretty much every culture on earth has dance. But it doesn't mean that everybody's a dancer, right? We can see precursors of dance in children. If you turn on music, you don't have to teach them to. The average two-year-old will start moving around to the music. Humans seem to have a natural predilection toward the kinds of physical movements that, when structured and organized, we would call dance. For that reason, I suspect, dance is a really common, cross-culturally recurrent form of cultural expression. It's pushing the right buttons. It's close to those anchor points. But it doesn't follow that everyone's going to be a dancer, let alone good at it. Likewise with religion. Okay? So that's my naturalist thesis. If you want to read more about that stuff, here are a few of the recent books. But uh, I think we can move into discussion or something like that. So thank you for your attention. If you've got a question, if you raise your hand, we'll give you the mic. We'd ask that you use the mic so that it picks up on our recording. Don't be shy. It wasn't that clear. And apparently this is a safe space, so you're allowed to ask anything or something like that. Uh, uh, when you talked about eyes would cause more people to act more, you know, good in a sense, is that just human eyes or could there be animal eyes or something or does that have to resemble human eyes? Good question. Um, I don't know that anyone has tried to look at the difference. Um, and so usually when they're put on their... It's a, a, you know, a pair of eyes kind of looking at you. But you're raising a good question. That's a nice research question for the following reason. Um, of course, th there is, you know, the, the placement of eyes on an animal is not arbitrary. And, right? So what kinds of animals have two eyes that could be looking at you? Primates, yes, but what else? Oh, huh, what? Predators. Prey animals have their eyes where? On the side. So they never have two of them looking at you. They do this stuff, right? They look at you one at a time. So if something has two eyes looking at you, you better pay attention. There's something really visceral about that, right? Um, so I got a question about your um, born believers thesis. Uh, just maybe some of the context of uh, children having to learn that people die. And it's been my experience that adults have to do that too. Yeah. We know that it exists, but until you experience it personally, it's a completely different experience. Yeah. And so in that uh, kind of wire, use the word wiring, or I'll use the word wiring just for simplicity's sake, that we're born into this world of a reality of possibilities that's potentially endless or wonder-filled. Um, where is that point of, uh, let's see if I can make this more clear, where is that point where people start to hone in on things like the inevitability of death? You yeah. could be in your 80s and never real experience until you experience it. Yeah, yeah. Like, so is there something about the physicality of the experience as opposed to the concept of it? 
that gaming can't really reveal. You know, that those kind of experiments can't reveal. Yeah. No, good question. And uh, I'm, I'm no death expert. Uh, <laughs> what I, I, so I don't have a, a really good answer for you. I can, I can give you some thoughts, though, around this space. Um, what I do understand to be the case is that uh, death does seem to be somewhat surprising. Um, even, as you say, I mean, even if on a, in a conceptual level we, we know it's coming. Um, and what do I mean by surprising? I mean that our conceptual systems don't seem to have an off switch for the existence of people, especially people we really know well and interact with regularly. So it's very common after somebody who's very close to you dies than to actually have hallucinations of, as well as dreams of that person coming back or being present. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a person. I mean, I, I had a pet ferret and when it died, I thought it was in the kitchen for about a week later. It just, I'd, I'd hear noises and I'd look for it. Um, and I don't think I was that attached to the ferret. But we don't seem to have an off switch for individuals. That's, that's easily done. Um, and in fact, that, that very fact has led some scholars who work in this space, uh, such as Jesse Baring, who is, I think he would accept the label cognitive scientist of religion. Um, he's, he even thinks that um, death is slightly counterintuitive, okay? Or at least it's, that it's uh, even people who don't believe in the continuation of life after death find themselves thinking about someone watching them, find themselves thinking that the deceased is happy about their funeral. Because um, he's speaking for his own experience. And he's an atheist who thinks that, you know, death, that's it. It's the end. But he found himself sort of drifting to, oh, did that loved one, is, do they care about this? And there have been actual studies on this, too. So uh, both in China, uh, in the US, uh, also in Britain, uh, Madagascar, looking at do people seem to continue to generate thoughts about the deceased after their death? And are they all that confident that death is the end? So in one of these studies, instead of just asking people, well, you can do both, you can just ask people, your average Chinese person in, an East, in one of the big East Coast cities, highly educated, very secular kind of environment, you say, so, when people die, is that it? That's the end? That, yes, absolutely. Okay, let me tell you a story about you know, Bob. And Bob's driving down the street. He's just had a fight with his wife, and he's really kind of angry at her. And he puts a mint in his mouth, and he's a little bit distracted, and he crashes his car, and, um, and he dies instantly. Uh, paramedics show up. No, he's dead. Um, is Bob still mad at his wife? Well, yeah, I kind of think he is. Um, people are much more confident that he's no longer hungry than that he's mad at his wife. Um, and you might try your own intuitions on this. Do you think, even for those of you who think that death is the end, try out these sorts of ideas about someone who, you know, a loved one who is deceased. So do they still love you? Hard to say, no, they don't. And I don't think it's just the love thing. There are lots of these mental states that actually have led some people to think who work in this area that the idea of minds ending at death is actually hard to understand. We're, bodies we get, we get machines breaking, but we don't get minds breaking. Minds seem to have their own kind of space in this, um, which maybe helps actually encourage afterlife beliefs, uh, ancestor beliefs. Ghosts and ancestors might be the most common and oldest of religious beliefs. I mean, I say might. No one really knows for sure. But they're sure all over the place. And maybe it's because death is really actually conceptually difficult. So there, you got a little more than you asked for. But. How does your theory um, work with 
or against the idea that propensity towards religion is driven by the desire to answer the unknown. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'd say a couple of things. One is um, I'm not sure, sure that many people have uh, a strong desire or propensity to answer the unknown. Honestly, I, I think some people do. But I don't think most people all over the world who are just trying to eke out their survival are all that bothered about those kinds of things. I don't think that they're spending a whole lot of time in their heads about, you know, what are the big questions of life. Big questions of life are survival. They're, uh, you know, where's, where's food going to come from? How am I going to survive this next season? How, where am I going to plant my crops? When am I going to plant them? It's really practical. Um, and uh, my anthropologist colleagues say, well, you know, this, this focus on ideas, beliefs, answering those big questions is an intellectualist tendency that's really part of the weird Western overeducated world that we live in. But it's not that common the rest of the world. And most people in other places, they're not all that interested in explaining things like the meaning in life for instance, that's not why you know you believe that there are spirits in the forest. You believe that there are spirits in the forest because if you don't do the rituals the right way, you don't actually you're not successful in your hunts. That's why you believe there are spirits in the forest. Or if you don't do the rituals the right way, you have crummy crops. That's why you believe in doing these rituals the right way to appease the ancestors or whoever they are. It's to solve practical problems. Maybe I was misunderstanding the question, though. Um, so it's not clear that most religious beliefs in most places are actually fundamentally motivated by trying to answer questions. Um, it's been observed by Pascal Boyer, who works in the area, anthropologist, that usually the religions that answer those kinds of questions, well, are religions believed in by people who are interested in those questions. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but not anyone else. Where did all of this come from? I don't know. I don't care. Never even think about it. Right? It's a, it'll, a lot of people's answer. Or so, what is the grand meaning and purpose of life? I don't know. Don't bother me with your weird questions. Stay away from me, you weird educated people. I'm, you clearly have too much time on your hands. I'm just trying to survive. Um, <laughs> I hate to be deflationary about this. It is. OK, now that I've said all of that, let me be clear. Some people really are interested in these things. And religious belief systems, and I feel this way about mine, really does offer answers to some of these questions. I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm, what I'm saying is I don't think that's most people's primary kind of impetus to be religious. It, it seems to me that someone whose profession is spiritual mentoring of others um, would really benefit from understanding these predispositions. And it even seems to me looking at, like, for instance, I'm an Anglican, so we have the Hebrew Scriptures, the New Testament, and we have the stories of the saints. You know, it seems to me that using those stories to try to get people to come to a more transcendent view of God and a more transcendent self-emptying expression as purpose of life. It seems to me knowing these kind of things could really help such a professional. Great. I agree. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think uh, a few of us working in this have, have made reference to, Boyer's called it the tragedy of the theologian. I've called it uh, the theological correctness kind of effect. And it's this it, it's all trying to point at, or it's sometimes called theological incorrectness, pointing at this problem that if we don't, we as people who try to teach these kinds of things and encourage other ways of thinking, if we don't know where the barriers are, we're going to be surprised by them. We're not going to know where to invest. So the doctrine of grace, for instance, and again, tomorrow I'll, I'll say more about this, but it looks like it's a tricky one. It seems to run against human nature in some ways. But for most Christians, this is a fundamental doctrine. 
it's not negotiable. You know, this unmerited favor that God has done something for us, not something we can earn, and it does not put us in debt to God, all sounds really strange on an intuitive level because it appears that we're naturally inclined to believe in tit-for-tat kinds of relationships. If you do something for me, I have to do something for you. That makes sense. And in fact, we feel comfortable in that. We want to dispense our obligations as quickly as possible. Okay, you just did something for me. How can I quickly sort of pay down that debt so that I'm not indebted to you? And for someone else to get let off the hook of their debt really rubs us the wrong way. So that God's extending grace to him? Really? That just doesn't seem right on a deep, intuitive kind of level. So I think there's one of those examples of a place where if we don't understand where sort of human cognition and, and feelings and affect naturally go, we're going to go, why are they not getting this? <laughs> you did. You just nailed my biggest challenge as a pastor. I, I hope that's a helpful thing. <laughs> we have one back here. Having only heard your thesis tonight, I haven't had a lot of time to think about this, but I think about a grandson. I want to tell you a quick, short version of a story. You know, he raised in the church from cradle roll on up. But very early, uh, maybe not, maybe preschool, very, very early school, if not preschool, he went to Sunday school one morning and heard a overly literalistic Sunday school teacher talk about God up in heaven and could see us down here on earth. And I wasn't there. I can't tell you much more about it. But he came home and told his mother, I don't believe in God. And she said, well, why? What is this? He says, because God can't see around curves. <laughs> so she called me right away and asked, what do I do? And um, I said, I'd take him out of that Sunday school for starting. <laughs> but how do you put together a kid that young who so naturally yeah, yeah. was ready to be a non-believer <laughs> with your thesis? And maybe if I thought about it all the way home tonight, I could come up with an answer, but you could... Save me that. You could bring me the answer in the morning, right? Save me from that. No, there's definitely going to be exceptions here, but um, you know, without the details, it's a little hard to know, right? Uh, but what could be some obstacles? Well, I think one maybe, maybe is at play in this story, and that is um, that one way or another, what's been communicated to the child is not God as a God, but God as a human being. Okay, so that is a confusion that we see in a lot of kids is, well, they'll, they'll think that the pastor sometimes is God. That one's not uncommon. I've heard that a lot. Um, <laughs> or that God really is the name of a human being. And then if they're a clever kid, they're going to know what the properties of a human being are, and they're going to know if the story doesn't make any sense. But that's because they started with a faulty assumption that we were talking about a human being. So... They may, I mean, it's, it's sort of common to say, well, when I hear pastors and evangelists say things, you know, if, if people say, you know, I don't believe in Jesus, well, tell me about this Jesus you don't believe in. Okay, I don't believe in that Jesus either. Well, my guess is probably none of us believe in the God that that kid was taught, um, or at least what the child thought was being communicated. Um, so maybe that's what's going on. It was just, a, okay, God is the name for a very strange human being, if, if it was this really highly crudely anthropomorphic kind of thing. And I'm smart enough to know what the limitations on a human being are. So this person's talking nonsense to me. So I'm rejecting that. But that doesn't necessarily mean foreclosed to all of this other stuff, right? And again, the picture isn't that a four-year-old, when they hear about God, is going to go, oh, yep, that's the one. I'm, I'm done. Story over. Search complete, um, but that there are going to be a limited number of 
answers to these sort of intuitive conceptual questions. Now some kids maybe for interesting reasons just don't have the same conceptual spaces. But I think most kids are. At least that's where the evidence is pointing. So I wish I could give you a more concrete kind of answer. Here's my best attempt. Maybe by the morning you'll have a better one for me. I have a couple for you. The first, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in the assertion that the counterintuitive is more interesting and captures our intention. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's a commonality um, in human nature that where we jump off of that as well, like where, uh, where the interesting becomes the absurd. Yeah. And it becomes boring again. Good. So I'm, I'm interested in that. And the second question is, uh, in the context of your work and your lecture, is there a difference between the mind and the self? And if there is, could you give us a differentiation between those two? OK, yeah, mind and self. By mind, I'm really talking about the, um, the thinking, feeling kinds of activities um, and not necessarily the rest of the self. Uh, I mean, I put feelings inside the mind as well, but not necessarily all the body stuff. Um, and I'm not paying attention to the non-conceptual things like, you know, I don't know, hunger, for instance, or needing to go to the bathroom. But I would take it, those are all part of the self. Um, and at least at this point, I'm not referring to self-identity or anything like that. Uh, you raise a very good point about the sort of minimal counterintuitive. Actually, because I went awfully fast through that section, what the theory proposes is there's sort of a, an optimum. There's a Goldilocks zone. OK? So if it's too mundane, a brown dog, meh, don't care. Then it drifts over into the just a little bit counterintuitive, invisible dog. OK, all right, that's kind of cool. That's interesting. OK, now let's make it even more counterintuitive. The invisible dog that sustains itself on crude oil, gives birth to kittens, experiences time backwards, and only exists on Wednesdays. Oh, and only remembers things that never happened. OK, I have no idea what you're talking about. Too conceptually fragmented. It's not a concept anymore. So it's hard to communicate. It's hard to remember. I just said it, but I suspect nobody can recreate all of that. Because it just doesn't make sense. It's a laundry list of features at that point. And I think you're right. At that point, eh, you might find this an interesting thing. Apparently, people who work in fantasy and sci-fi writing and movie production struggle with just the same problem. You've got to find the Goldilocks zone. Now, fortunately, in certain genres of entertainment, there are tropes that get developed that can help scaffold you to more complex kinds of things, but the same general principle applies. Good science fiction tweaks us enough, or fantasy, that we think, wow, this is a cool world. But if you step back for a second, you realize 99% of everything is just exactly like this world. But they've put in nice little strategic tweaks that keep us interested, generate new inferences and possibilities. But if they go too far, I have no idea what you're talking about, and I put the book down or turn the movie off because I just can't follow it. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, right behind here, the man in plaid again. Uh, so two things. I, I thought about it before. I kind of called it zone of proximal belief because it kind of goes with that scaffolding thing. But uh, my question is that you talked about um, when they're at the age of four or five and uh, the concept of God really fits them in their schema, are uh, children more prone to believing multiple gods versus a single god, or does that depend really on the culture good. that they're in? We don't know. Um, good, good question. I'm not proposing that sort of strict monotheism is more natural than anything else. Um, and in fact, if you look around, there aren't many strict monotheists. Even Christians are not strict monotheists, right? I mean, they typically also believe in ghosts and angels and devils and so forth. So there are other gods, little g, around. Um, and that seems to be true of most cultures. So I don't, I don't think so. I think, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. No reason to think that monotheism is, is privileged in this regard. Billy. You mentioned an interesting chronology of the 1960s were kind of a break point. <clears throat> My question relates to the place of religion in the Western culture, okay. as we know today. As evolution continues on, one would assume that thought is going to modify as it 
continues to evolve. The current studies that I read, about 25% of the population today are claiming to be nuns, mm -hmm. where they claim no religious affiliation, where they're spiritual, not religious. Uh, as this generation moves on, and, that, and that's, as I understand, uh, particularly relevant to the millennials, yeah. and so as we go from that generation through the next generation, and that cultural indoctrination is no longer necessarily part of the fundamental culture, where will they seek the God? Good. Um, great question. A couple of, uh, they're sort of factual issues and then they're nice speculative issues, which is uh, a wonderful balance. Um, the, the, on the factual side of things, it's true that we're seeing this really big swell in the number of people who don't identify with any religious tradition. They would, they're nuns, as it's called. On, actually, a minority of the nuns are actually atheists or agnostics. Still a majority of nuns say they believe in God or something like God. But what they're refusing to do is identify with a particular religious tradition. Nothing that I said actually pertained to religious traditions. It pertained to the little bits and pieces, uh, right? To the particular beliefs, practices, and so forth that then get joined up into traditions. So we might see the nun thing continue. I suspect not. And I suspect not, not because, well, I suspect not because the organized collective shared stuff seems to play some really important social roles for us. I suspect one of the reasons we're seeing so many nuns, particularly among millennials, is, uh, well, and younger people really, millennials are starting to get older now. So, I mean, it's particularly among younger people because uh, of this delayed, adult, uh, what's called a prolonged or delayed adolescence that we're also seeing in a lot of younger people. So if you sort of flip back to the, uh, the textbooks in psychology of religion from 20 years ago or 30 years ago before all of the nuns stuff was coming about, you could see a pretty regular developmental trend where the, the least religious people, the people least likely to identify with a religion, were going to be teenagers, college students. That's where you hit the trough. And then you see them bump back up and starting to join religious groups and identifying again when they have children. And this generation is having children really late. And so it's stretching out that window. I suspect that's actually a big part of it. There's something about having kids that makes you go, okay, all right, all right, I better take my life seriously and start thinking about what my values and what's important to me and I have a supportive community and how can I do that? Brave space ball, well, no, okay, all right, I guess I'll go to the church, right? I mean, you see that kind of impulse. Uh, you referenced evolution and the continued evolution. I'll just throw this in just for fun. No doubt it'll come back and bite me later. Uh, I was at a conference less than half a year ago where there's some lead um, human evolution theorists and they made a really interesting observation that human evolution, at least in a biological sense, probably isn't going to change that much in the foreseeable future. And by foreseeable they mean 100,000 years or so. The reason is the conditions under which we see speciations I'm not an expert on this. I'm just repeating what I was told by people who are experts on this. The conditions under which you see rapid change in speciation are not our current positions. We're too genetically fluid. We're too, we move around too much. You need little islands, genetic islands, to get specialization, to get com competition against each other. And you need to really crank up sort of the environmental stressors as well. That helps. And we just don't have those. And it's not clear we're going to get those back until we do things like put people on Mars and then, then they're going to grow a third head or whatever it is, right? But, so just throw that in just for fun. Who knows if we're going to evolve? But much more interesting is how our cultural context is scaffolding us and enabling us to think things we didn't think before because we have formal education systems and we have special um, symbolic systems like mathematics and written stuff. And we can distribute our thought processes around people and use cognitive prosthetics like computers. Those are helping us think in new ways. 
I don't know if I would apply the word evolution to those, but those could stretch us in interesting ways. But what I'm suggesting is because those don't change fundamentally our nature, there's always going to be this pullback of human nature. Yeah, I can think the fancy stuff, but at a certain point it just doesn't feel right. It just, it just doesn't sit right because it's not intuitive. That's the suggestion. I could have this all wrong, but how are we doing? Are we tired? Are we still going? All right. You got stamina. I like that. Um, in this age of fake news. Uh huh. Um, and fake science too. Huh? Is that where you're going? Yeah. <laughs> is there a predis? And I assume based on what you're saying, is there a predisposition for certainty? Is there? a need for us to be assured this is the truth as, a verse, as opposed to whatever? That's a great question. Um, and I can only speculate on that. Um, I, I would classify that question as falling into a domain that I would call the study of folk epistemology, and it hasn't really developed yet as a field. PhDs to be had, students out there. Um, what, but my, what my gut says is we're more concerned with making things work than having certainty. So certainty about making things work, about solving problems, about it being good enough. And actually, that's why we like science, okay? I love science. On my more high-minded moments, it's all about pursuit of truth having tools for getting more certainty in our knowledge. But that's not what gets policymakers to put money towards science. That's not what gets the general public excited about science, it seems to me. What gets us excited about science is it makes stuff for us that we like. It solves practical problems. And we don't care if it's delivering truth or not as long as it's getting us close enough to stuff that works, right? And I think most sci scientists in their sober moments say, look, if you look at the history of science, there have been these massive sort of revolutions of, well, we used to think this, and now we just don't anymore. But that science back then that now is kind of old, passe, it solved really good problems. It helped us build certain kinds of machines, like classic mechanics. You might say, well, it's kind of wrong at a certain point. Yeah, but it builds cool stuff. So it's good enough. Don't need certainty, need assurance that it's going to make stuff, which is different, right? Um, but that's an aside. So, I mean, that, see, you're seeing what I do. If I don't have a good answer to the direct question, I make up a question and answer that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think, if, are there any other questions? If not, we will see you in the morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.